Welcome everybody to this episode of Claims Corner. If you have any questions for our guest speakers today, please make sure you put them in the chat box or in the Q&A box, and one of us will ask them for you at the end of the presentation. So joining us today are Ms. Lauren Mills, hey Lauren, and Jay Dykstra, hi Jay. Lauren is the relationship manager for HVACI and Strike Check, and Jay is the technical education manager. HVACI, HVAC investigators and Strike Check are the leaders in independent assessments for both HVAC and electrical system claims exclusively for insurance carriers. They conduct over 100 presentations per year. Prior to being the technical education manager for HVACI and Strike Check, Jay was a senior property learning facilitator for a top five carrier and worked at their claim training center for seven years. Jay also has many years experience as an outside property claim representative, handling both personal lines and commercial line claims, as well as traveling across the country on catastrophe duty. Please welcome Lauren and Jay. Thank you so much for that introduction, Julie, and good afternoon, everyone. My name, as she said, is Lauren Mills. I'm one of the relationship managers here at HVACI and Strike Check, and I'm going to be acting as the host and moderator for today's HVAC Fundamentals webinar. Just wanted to start by saying thank you all so much for joining Jay and I today. We're both so excited to be here and not only tell you more about HVACI, but also hopefully provide you with some great takeaways that you can apply to your everyday role. Before we get started with the technical content, I'm going to walk us through the agenda so that you know what to expect out of today's presentation. I'll start by going into a little more detail about who HVACI is, what we do, and just how significant HVAC related claims are. I'll then turn the presentation over to Jay, who will handle the educational portion and talk to you about how HVAC systems are designed to operate as they come off the manufacturing floor. Jay will then break down the split system component by component as these systems along with package units are likely what you'll see in the field as these make up the overwhelming majority of the HVAC installation base in the country. And then we will finish with a question and answer portion so do be sure to submit your technical or service related questions as we move through the presentation. I want to set the stage by first discussing why we care so much about HVAC claims and just how significant they really are. From a global perspective, last year 47% of residential claims turned out to be non-covered losses. So I want to let that sink in. That's pretty much one of every two claims that were found to be non-covered. To break that number down a bit further, 10% of these claims were found to be non-damaged. An example of this may be that when the technician visits the lost location, they flip the breaker and the system fires right back up. For 32% of these claims, the cause of loss was age-related wear and tear damage. So as the name suggests, this could be an older system that's simply at the end of its useful lifespan. The remaining 5% were actually withdrawn claims, so maybe once the insured understands that an objective service provider and expert will be the one to evaluate the loss, the claim sort of evaporates from there. So for our purposes, we can collapse that number into the non-damaged category. And while this data is significant on a macro level, it's also important to look at it on an individual claim level because this is where we really start to examine the dollars and cents. If you look at the top blue bar here, this represents the average residential claimed amount last year, which landed at about $8,400, $8,500. As you may be able to guess, most of the time this amount is sourced from a quote that proposes a full system replacement. The red bar below represents our recommended settlement amount after an on-site assessment has been completed, and that average came out to about $3,400, which leaves an accuracy gap of more than $5,000 per residential claim. When we compare this to commercial losses, we see that that accuracy gap actually increases significantly to over $33,000 per claim. So while each claim does hold its own significance, when you apply this to the tens of thousands of claims that we see each year, it really starts to add up. And now I'll tell you a little more about who HVACI is, the services we offer, and what you can expect from our final reports. We are headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. However, we do have nationwide claims coverage. We have more than a thousand forensic technicians who perform these damage assessments for us and have a full-time recruiting staff in-house that's responsible for onboarding our technicians and educating them on the business of insurance. 
We provide tens of thousands of HVAC reports annually, and we're proud to be the largest and leading provider of these services exclusively for insurance carriers. Our affiliate companies are Strike Check and Donan Engineering, and we'll get into a little more detail regarding Strike Check services as we move through the presentation. At the end of the day, our mission is really simple. What we want to do is help you settle your HVAC claims with confidence. And this is just a small sample of the variety of equipment types that HVACI can assist with. At HVACI, we do have four main focuses, the first being objectivity. If you ever look at our logo, you'll see that our tagline reads, just the facts, and that's exactly what we're after. We don't know how the insurance policy reads, and to be honest, we don't want to know. We're only concerned with uncovering the facts, letting you know what caused the damage to the system and exactly what needs to be done to restore it to pre-loss condition. Second, we're strongly focused on our cycle time. From the time that we receive an assignment until the time that you receive our final report is an average of three to five business days for residential claims and five to seven business days for commercial. Third, we pride ourselves on providing you with actionable reports. What this means is that all the information that you need to settle your claim can be found on the very first page. One thing I really want to highlight is that the market pricing in our reports does come directly from the, from the manufacturer. So that is completely up to date and parts availability has been verified for that specific loss location. And lastly, we have the education of our partners. This is a huge part of J&I's role and why we're here today. We're really here to raise the overall awareness on how these systems are designed to work so you feel comfortable and confident when handling those HVAC claims. I'll also let you know the difference between our two service offerings. The first is our on-site investigation. This makes up about 90% of our total claims and what is, is what I've been primarily referencing so far. So for this type of assessment, we're going to go to the lost location to have our technicians get their eyes on the equipment so we can tell you what caused the damage to the system and our repair versus replacement recommendation. Our second service offering is our desktop review service, or what we sometimes call the eye check. This is really great for scenarios where maybe you have an insured who was quick to take action and they replace their system, then they discarded the damaged components, so now that system is no longer available for an on-site assessment. Or maybe you're already confident on the cause of loss, but you're left with an estimate from their contractor recommending that you replace the entire system and you want to verify that pricing is correct. In either case, we can check pricing from a market perspective and make sure that it is like kind and quality with what the insured had prior to the loss. The turnaround time for a desktop review is shorter at about four business hours for residential claims and one business day for commercial claims. I should note, however, this cycle time is based on the assumption we can get in touch with the insurance contractor who did provide that quote, since that's who will be calling to lend any needed clarification or break down that ballpark estimate for us. And now, as promised, I'll walk you through a few pages of our report. For those of you who have not yet worked with us, this is the first page of the report, and the top half here has all of the claim details and your insured's information. The bottom half is the evaluation summary, and this is where we'll break down the cause of loss, repair or replacement costs, the estimated time frame for completion, and our recommended settlement amounts both pre- and post-depreciation. Further into the report, we'll give you a breakdown of how we came to that recommendation and what that recommendation is to get the system back to pre-loss condition. Here you'll see the recommended settlement breakdown, and in this table, we will break down our recommended settlement line by line with the cost and labor associated with each component. It's not shown here, but I also like to mention further into the report, we'll also provide you with a replacement breakdown. Regardless of whether the system requires replacement or not, we will include a replacement amount that is like kind and quality to the existing system, just in case you need that information as a reference point for any reason. Because we do give both the repair and replacement breakdown, we'll also always provide you with an insured's copy of the report, and that is clearly labeled and really serves as an abbreviated copy of the adjuster's report. The insured copy only includes cause of loss and our recommendation for bringing the system back to pre-loss condition. This really allows the policyholder to review our report without getting confused by seeing both the repair and replacement recommendation and wondering exactly what it is that we're recommending. We do not send this copy to the insured and leave it completely up to your discretion whether or not to share the report with them. We will also always provide you with the photographs that were taken on site during the assessment, and these will include detailed captions so you know exactly what components of the system that you're looking at. 
Here you'll see an overview of our resolution team. Our resolution team is our customer service specialist group and all team members have a high technical background. This team really functions to help our clients once our report has been published and they provide technical support for adjusters or managers to better understand the reported damages and can also assist with any policyholder or contractor disagreements on pricing, scope of work, or the cause of loss that's outlined in our report. I wanted to briefly circle back to our affiliate company Strike Check, which I mentioned earlier. Strike Check essentially handles all of the items with limited exceptions that we're unable to assess on the HVACI side. Strike Check handles residential systems for all types of perils, not just lightning and search, and the reporting does follow the same format as the HVACI reports that we reviewed earlier. Just like HVACI, they offer on-site assessments to confirm cause of loss and repair scope, or they can do desktop reviews to confirm pricing. And the item types that they assess include things like electronics, appliances, electrical systems, pool and hot tub equipment, solar panels, and so much more. So if you're ever unsure of whether or not we can assist with a certain type of equipment, simply give us a call or shoot us an email. This concludes my introduction and the HVACI service overview, so thank you all for your time and attention so far. I'm going to turn it over to Jay, who will begin the educational portion of the presentation. Over to you, Jay. All right, thank you so much. So, Julie, I appreciate that great introduction you gave, and Lauren, thanks so much for that background information. Hopefully that gives everybody a good idea of, of the services that are out there to help adjusters, because that's really what we're here to do today is give you information to help adjusters. Um, we, I, being a past adjuster, I know handling claims is very difficult. And when you get into a technical claim scenario, it makes it even that much more difficult. So now we're moving on with the technical content today and we have a lot to cover. This is actually a condensed or a reduced version of a bigger uh, program we do called HVAC fundamentals. But I don't want that word fundamentals to um, make you think this is easy. <laughs> the word fundamental doesn't mean easy in this case. Fundamental means fundamentally, how do these things work, right? And not everybody understands that. And I really wanna make sure everybody understands that by the time we're done today, because you're gonna to wanna to build your confidence. So when you're talking to policyholders and contractors, um, you're gonna to wanna to build your credibility as well. So um, as mentioned earlier by Julie, we love questions. So if you have a lot of questions, put them in there and we will stay as long as we need afterwards to handle um, all those questions that come in. And I'm, I'm guessing we're gonna get a few on this. So, and if you didn't think you were gonna get a science lesson today, well, guess what? You probably might be a little bit surprised because we are gonna talk a lot about science um, and how these things operate. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty now, and you can see in my word cloud, there are all kinds of terms and um, science items and things like that. And look at that big one right in the middle, thermodynamics. If we didn't talk about that today, you really wouldn't know how these systems operate. And more specifically, we're going to talk about that second law of thermodynamics. You may remember this, if you took physics in high school or college, God bless you if you did. Um, you might remember thermodynamics, right? You could have talked about it the entire semester. You probably had a three inch textbook, right? Well, we're not gonna go that deep. We're gonna narrow it down to one concept that's gonna help us understand how these systems operate, all right? And that concept is heat moves to cold and not vice versa, all right? If you've never given that any thought before, by the end of the day today in this session, um, you're gonna get it right? Heat moves to cold and not vice versa. So it's very critical you understand that. And we're actually going to apply the second law of thermodynamics two separate times in the cooling mode of an air conditioning system. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. These systems are closed loop systems. And when I say closed loop, I'm really talking about the refrigerant. All right, this refrigerant when these systems are uh, engaged is continually on the move. All right, and something else that happens is it's continually changing state. So sometimes the refrigerant is in a gas or vapor state and other times it's in a liquid state. And I'll be sure to point that out as we go through this system. And we are going to get down to that level of detail on this uh, refrigerant system and the components that make these systems work, because those are the things that show up on your estimates and your reports and your contractors uh, quotes and stuff like that. I wanna make sure you know why they're there, <laughs> if they should even be there and um, what why they're important to make these systems operate. 
So what are the two main functions in cooling mode of an air conditioning system? Sometimes we do polling questions, and this is one of my classic polling questions because not everybody understands this. And I'm thinking we have quite a few people on here today. I'm thinking we'll probably might have some surprised people here. When I was learning about this, believe me, I, I was surprised. So the two main cooling functions of an HVAC system are to transfer or remove heat and to reduce humidity. All right. Notice that what that does not say. That does not say generate cold air. All right. This is the part where some of you might be scratching your head. Um, air conditioning systems have no way to generate cold air. And that, doesn't that just sound ridiculous? Um, I know when it was, in, you know, when I was growing up, you turn on the air conditioner, you hear that thing outside making a bunch of noise. The cold air is coming out of the registers, right? Or out of, you know, out of the vents. And I'm like, well, whatever that thing's doing out there, it's generating cold air and I feel more comfortable, right? That's great. They have no way to generate cold air, okay? They actually move heat, which to you might seem like semantics, but it's not, it's very different. It's physically moving the heat molecules. And this is the refrigerant doing this, gathering heat molecules inside, taking them outside and uh, ejecting them outside. And we'll talk about more about that. I work with a lot of people, as you can imagine, in the HVAC business, and it's pretty common for them to say, we're in the heat transfer business. They don't say we're in the cold air business or anything like that. We're in the heat transfer business. And that goes for the smallest window unit all the way up to those giant chillers on the top of high rise buildings. Fundamentally, they're working the same. They're moving heat. They're not generating cold air. And a happy byproduct of this whole process is we're able to reduce humidity. All right. And as humans, we really need to balance those two things. We really need both to be the most comfortable. So if you think you about being in Phoenix, where it's 105 degrees, I don't care what anybody says about dry heat, you're probably not comfortable at 105 degrees, right? So on the other hand, you could be anywhere else in the country. It might be 75 degrees, which sounds delightful, unless it's 95% humidity then you're still probably gonna be sticky, you're gonna be sweating and you might not be as comfortable, right? So we really do need to balance both the humidity and the heat. And that is what these systems are able to do for us. And that's what makes them, the, you know, makes them so effective. So let's uh, continue on. And we're gonna get into the details of these split systems. And split systems are the most common residential system, which I don't think is any surprise to any of you on the line today. It's actually the second most common commercial system. So if you're gonna be handling claims and HVAC equipment shows up on it, pretty good chance uh, a split system is gonna show up. So that's why we're gonna talk about that today. Plus everything we learn about split systems, we can apply to the other types of systems for the, for the most part. They're basically called split systems because the two main components, um, the condenser and the evaporator are in two different places. They're split from one another with that condenser being on the outside of the structure. If it's a small business or a residence, it's usually on a pad next to the building, like in our diagram. If it's a larger commercial building, it's probably up on the roof. And I'll show a picture of that here shortly. On the inside, we have an air handler or furnace. And that terminology gets a little confused sometimes. So I'll, I'll see if I can just break it down um, a little bit for you. In our diagram, we see an upflow furnace. Okay, it's standing vertically, and that would be in a basement, a closet, um, maybe the garage, and, it, and it's standing vertically. It has all those components in the middle by that number two that are capable of generating heat. Okay, you're probably burning a fuel like natural gas. That's the most common. You have an exhaust flue. Uh, you have heat exchangers. At that point, we're going to call that a furnace because it's generating heat. But not every unit generates heat. Sometimes it's just the air conditioning equipment. At that point, we would call it just an air handler. All right. Where it gets confusing is like in our diagram, we have a furnace. We've added an evaporator coil on top of it. So in the summer, we can also share that ductwork and do uh, air conditioning as well. That's where I think it gets a little confusing. But a furnace and an air handler, um, in, the, in the true sense of the um, statements, are really two very different things. We're going to focus on um, air handling and cooling today. Connecting those two main components are the two copper pipes known as the line set. 
and set, obviously, two. And we're going to talk more about that when we get into the components, but that is um, the um, pipes carrying the refrigerant inside and out. Next is the thermostat. And a lot of people, you forget about it, right? It's not in the same area. It's located somewhere in the house. There could be multiple thermostats by zone, the big house, either end of the house, different floors, things like that. You know, back, uh, I'm showing my age a little bit, back when I was handling claims, the thermostat wasn't a big deal. It was a mechanical device, little dial on the wall. If you missed it on an estimate, somebody might not even notice it's 25 bucks, you know, not, not, you know, not a huge issue. That's not true today. <laughs> Now they are programmable. They might be smart home devices. They're Wi-Fi enabled. They're digital displays. They have control boards in them and they're not cheap, right? So you can't forget about the thermostat. And actually now that they're a mechanical device and Wi-Fi enabled, um, they could actually be part of the cause of the loss. Maybe there was a software uh, update error. Maybe there was a, um, a firmware error. Maybe somebody hacked into it, who knows? but the thermostat might actually play into the loss nowadays. Then we have the ductwork system. Uh, we could have a whole hour talking about ductwork and it can be very um, uh, lengthy on the different types and materials and styles and the functions of them. We don't have that time today, so we're gonna leave the, the ductwork out of it today, um, but just know in a, a standard split system, a st um, you'd have two sides of it, the return side to bring the air that needs to be conditioned to the evaporator and the supply side that supplies the cooler dryer air to the structure. If you don't remember anything else from today, which I hope you'll remember all of it, but if you don't remember anything else um, for claim handling, you need to remember that these systems are modular in design. And you might wonder what I, what I mean by that. And what I mean by that is they're designed to be repaired. And that makes a big difference on how you handle a claim, right? So what's a good analogy for that? A good analogy, and a lot of people can um, make sense of it easier this way, is your car or your truck, your automobile, right? Cars are by design uh, modular. If I, something happens to a new uh, the tire, I fix the tire or get a new tire. If I crack my windshield, I fix it or I get a new windshield. If my engine stops working, I take it to a mechanic and generally speaking, they fix it get it working again. If I uh, am careless and I back out and I back into my um, mailbox post and I dent my bumper, um, they fix the bumper, right? I, in any of those cases, in you know, most times I don't get a new car. The same thing goes for air conditioning systems, folks. You, when something goes wrong, you first attempt to fix it. And these things are modular. We can usually get the parts and make those repairs. As a matter of fact, um, the repair industry out there for HVAC is a multi-billion dollar endeavor. And most of those trucks and vans driving around that you see, um, some of them are installing new systems at new buildings and things like that. But most of them are driving from place to place fixing systems. Because I'm guessing if you're like me, if I get home this afternoon from work and my system's not working, what am I going to do? I'm gonna pick up the phone, call a technician, say, can you come evaluate it and fix it? I'm probably not gonna pick up the phone and say, hey, you wanna stop by and give me a $12,000 quote for a new system? Um, that's not the way it works. People fix these all the time. And that's the way we should proceed on an insurance claim as well is repairing these. So the statistics are overwhelming. 62% of the time on all causes of loss, all types of systems, they can be repaired. That's a big number. Look at the other 11%. Um, they're not even damaged. <laughs> so that only that leaves less than 30% of the time you need to replace systems when they're damaged. So if you're handling claims and you're thinking in your mind, you know what, I probably write to replace systems more than 30% of the time, you might want to slow down, you might want to ask for help, and you might want to um, re rethink that a little bit. Of course, it's different by different causes of loss. Um, but they can be from one extreme to the other. Like I know we probably have a lot of flood adjusters on here, just knowing uh, CNC's business. So if it's underwater, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna limit us some. But that just because the outside unit was underwater doesn't mean you need to replace the whole system, including the inside or vice versa. On the other hand, if you're handling hail claims, that repairability goes up to about 80% with another 11% not damaged. So like over 90% on a hail storm, do not need to be replaced. So if you're handling hail claims, shouldn't be replacing too many systems. 
let's move on. We got a lot to get through. This is a standard system, could be different shapes, sizes, colors. You see a, a commercial setting there where they're all different colors, shapes, sizes. Um, any of those could be heat pumps as well. So those are that's mainly brand specific. So I don't want to waste time on that, but I do want to get into the details and tell you how these systems work and then point out the components that make it work. And the first one is on the outside, we're starting with the we're starting with the condensing unit and that's the compressor. Great photo of it there sitting down there in the middle. And that compressor has two main functions. One is to be the heart of the system. It's pumping the refrigerant, all right? The other function is right in its name, compress. So you might be wondering, what am I compressing? Well, we're compressing the gas refrigerant. And that's critical. I just gave you your first clue. Remember I talked about the, the refrigerant being in different states. Um, so now we know when the refrigerant's in the compressor, it's in a gas state. And another reason we know that is because you cannot compress a liquid. More science. Go back to your eighth grade science class, you would have learned you can't compress a liquid. All right, it's phys physically impossible. So we're compressing this gas refrigerant, but why? All right, we're compressing it because when we compress a gas, it raises the pressure and it raises the temperature significantly. That's what I want you to remember. With the compressor um, pumps the refrigerant and it raises the temperature of the refrigerant significantly. All right, after it does that, it pumps the refrigerant, this hot gas refrigerant out to the coil and we're outside, so this is the condenser coil. We have the top off of this unit in that photo and the hot gas refrigerant's going back and forth, back and forth through those copper pipes, all right? Those copper pipes are sandwiched between fine aluminum fins as we see here. I'm not gonna have the time to get into too many damages here, but you can imagine these are easily damaged. Number one cause of loss, especially for adjusters, is hail. We have a whole hail class if you wanna learn more about that. But anyway, we have now all this great surface areas, great amount of surface area of good conducting metals, aluminum and copper, all right? And that is what we need for this next step. And I'll tell you more about that as we go. So that's the makeup of the condenser coil and what's going on with the refrigerant in the condenser. Now we're gonna talk about the fan and the fan motor, which is number three on this diagram. And when it's running, one, it's probably making some noise. Two, if you put your hand above, Above it, you have warm to even hot air being blown out of this unit, all right? Before I knew how these systems worked, I just thought that fan is cooling down the unit because whatever it's doing in there generating cold air, it's getting, it's, it's, that motor is getting hot doing it. That's not what's happening, folks, all right? This is where you got to pay attention. That fan um, is designed to ambient air through and across those coils, and then it ejects it out of the top. So that heat you're feeling when you put your hand above number three there is the heat molecules, yes, that just moments before were in the refrigerant, all right? Remember back of, of a few minutes ago, heat moves to cold and not vice versa, all right? The refrigerant is warmer than the air that's being pulled through it, so the heat leaves the refrigerant physically goes into the air and is ejected out of the top. How's that for you for some science? And you may have not known that, right? So fascinating how that works. I've been doing this for years and every time I talk about it and I think about it, I'm like, that still amazes me to this day. So that's the heat that was moments before in the refrigerant. Moments before that, that heat was inside the house. And we'll talk about that as we get to the inside equipment. When that happens, the refrigerant changes back to a liquid and it's given up its heat, so it's actually a cool liquid. So we've had a complete transformation from hot gas refrigerant to cool liquid refrigerant by the time it leaves this condensing unit. All right, how's that? So hopefully there's some good questions coming on that and we'll get to that at the end if you uh, need more clarification on what's going on there. Uh, we're gonna get away from the refrigerant circuit for just a minute. I'll go through these two items quickly, but part of the electrical system in the electrical compartment, which again, as an adjuster, you got your hands a little bit tied because you're not showing up <laughs> with a screwdriver and opening these things up and putting your own meter or your multimeter on this to test if it's working. But the capacitor fails all the time. And the capacitor is a small battery pack, which is needed to start both the 
fan motor and the compressor motor before those can continue to run on the electricity coming from the main electrical panel. But like any other battery, like in your phone or your flashlight or your car, um, they wear out. Battery technology is getting better, but it's not there yet. So this whole system could not be working and it might just be simply the capacitor has failed. But hey, guess what? There was a thunderstorm this week. So now they're calling it lightning damage. So you do need to um, have everything evaluated to make sure you know um, what the actual uh, you know, scenario is on why the system's not running. The contactor is another electrical piece of equipment in the, in the uh, electrical compartment there. And it is the electrical crossroads of this entire system. All right, lots of wires, those two red and black ones coming in at the top, those are probably 120 volts each. Very dangerous, don't be uh, sticking your hand in there, right? 240 volts. Uh, those smaller wires, those blue and the yellows are coming from the um, thermostat and the control board, telling it when to turn on and when to turn off and things like that. So a lot can go wrong in the, the um, contactor, but guess what? Wear and tear is also a huge cause of loss that is attributed to the contactor. The contactor is a mechanical device. There's parts in there that are physically moving and making contact. It's just like an electric switch, a standard electric switch, you know, not a dimmer or the fancy new ones, but um, you, you, when you to run electrical uh, um, uh, components, you need to close the circuit, different than water, right? So you close the circuit, allows the electricity to flow. That's what's happening in the contactor. Um, it's a little bit hard to see. Maybe I can zoom in for you a little bit. It's not, it's not a great picture, but that should be a pristine copper plate there. There's another one on the top. And when they make contact, the electricity flows through them and the system runs. Well, guess what happens? This thing cycles on and off um, dozens and dozens of times every day. Every time it makes contact and breaks contact, it arcs and sparks. And the contactors end up looking like this. That's not lightning damage. That's not surge damage. That's not water damage. That's wear and tear. And eventually it won't work at all. It's so pitted, they don't make good contact. You know, you can almost get like a brownout scenario and you can actually damage your system. So um, I can't tell you how many times we've had um, uh, systems fail and it's the contactor has worn out. So again, just so you know what these components are, what they do and how they could play into a claim scenario. Now we're onto the filter dryer, which is even a less known item on HVAC systems. It's basically like in your car filtering your oil. This is in the refrigerant line and it's filtering the refrigerant. These systems must have um, clean refrigerant to operate properly and not damage your compressor, okay? The one thing I'll say about these is they show up on estimates and reports like ours, um, sometimes when they weren't damaged. And I'll tell you why. If we have to open up this unit for any reason and work on it, like take out the refrigerant to put in a new, com a new compressor because it got fried by a surge, you're gonna see on that report a new filter dryer, even though it wasn't damaged. Because like your car, if I put new oil in it, I'm not gonna then drive it with an old filter. That just doesn't make sense, right? Same thing, you don't take refrigerant out and put it back in and leave the old filter dryer. You put a new filter dryer in. That's uh, industry best practices. So that's why you see that. <coughs> Excuse me. Almost all these systems have a disconnect. And that is where you can isolate the system to work on it safely. And there's a couple different kinds. They could be a breaker, physically a breaker. Remember Lauren said a lot of times you flip the breaker and it comes back on. There's probably a breaker inside the house, but there might be one at this uh, unit as well that the homeowner doesn't even know about. They don't know what's in that gray box. They've never looked, right? So that's possible. They're there, to they're there and designed to protect these systems. So they're gonna pop in a surge event, turn it back on, system runs. Could also be a simple or what I would call a low tech um, disconnect. You might have a pull tab at the top. You have two uh, copper plates in there that you know breaks that um, electrical current. What a lot of people don't know is these also could be part of the loss because many of them have fuses in them. Again, designed to protect the system in a surge um, event. Change out those fuses if they're blown, system fires right back up. Easy repair for a technician probably under deductible. We also have the service valves. Again, don't show up on too many claims, but they're down at the bottom. They're usually facing towards this structure and they really have two functions. One is the technician can put their gauges on it, run the system, check the high and low pressures and know, um, you know, use that to diagnose what might be going on with this system. 
The other thing they do is you can add or remove refrigerant from the service valves, and that's called charging or evacuating. Charging is adding refrigerant, evacuating is taking refrigerant out, and that's probably what it's called if in your estimating software as well. So charging and evacuating. Then we have that line set, semi-flexible copper lines. All right, semi-flexible copper lines. What's the first thing that should come to your mind as an adjuster when I say copper pipe? Should be, it's repairable, repairable. So my fun little analogy on this one is, um, say you have a leak in your basement and you have copper pipes in your house. You call a plumber, plumber comes out, goes in the basement, comes back up and the plumber says, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is I found the leak. The bad news is to fix it, I have to replace all your copper pipes in your entire house. You know what? <laughs> that's not gonna happen. They're gonna fix the copper pipe at the leak. They're gonna cut out the section that's damaged and put a new section in. Same thing applies for line sets. When the line set gets damaged, you don't put in a new line set. That's six or $700, depending how long it is and where it goes. Um, you fix it in most cases. So keep that in mind. The smaller one is called the liquid line because it has liquid refrigerant coming from the condenser to the evaporator. The larger one is called the suction line because it has gas or vapor refrigerant in it, and it's being pulled or sucked back to the um, compressor. Okay, so those are the two names. The small one's the liquid line, and the large one is the suction line. Some people call it the vapor line, but most, most technicians are gonna call that the suction line. So now you have a little bit more information on those, and your key takeaway for adjusting, always think repair on a line set before you replace a line set. Even if we, um, decide we have to replace the outside and inside equipment, you probably can save the line set. We can flush it out with an industry approved um, uh, flush kit and then um, put the inside and the outside units in and you're still save and you could save hundreds and hundreds of dollars that way. So um, if it's repairable, repair it. All right, let's go inside and talk about an air handler. And notice now I am showing a straight cool or an air handler unit only. And that looks different than when I showed you earlier, when I showed you a furnace. This one has no heating components in it and they've rearranged the items. In a straight cool air handler, most times they put the evaporator coil at the bottom called an integrated coil and the blower at the top. Whereas if you have a furnace, they normally, the blower's already built in at the bottom for the furnace. They add a cased coil on the top of the furnace. And that is different and the repairability of those two types are different as well. Cased coils are easily replaced individually. Integrated coils, not so much. All right, so that's something that might help you out. Not as many components to worry about inside, but there's definitely some. Uh, control boards. So control boards are easily damaged by water, lightning, surge, things like that. But the other side of that is they're easily replaced and they're available for all major brands. So if we have something go wrong with this control board, we put in a new control board. You don't get a new air handler and you don't get a new HVAC system. You put in a new control board, which is an easy repair for a technician and get this thing running again. The blower and the blower motor are um, something that comes up on claims quite often, especially if they uh, you have a surge or something like that. So again, let's talk about our little hierarchy, right? We have a, we have a determination, we have something wrong with the blower. First of all, you don't get a new HVAC system. Second of all, you don't get a new air handler. Third of all, you don't get a new blower, right? All you need to do is put a new blower motor in it, okay? These things are modular. If you look at that photo, you can't see the third screw, but it's up there at the top, it's hidden. Um, if you have access to this and you're a qualified technician, three screws, three or four wires, take it out, put a new one in, which you can get, and you've put a new blower motor in in less than 30 minutes, right? So, and you didn't pay for an entire HVAC system. And that shows up on reports all the time as well, because motors are inherently susceptible to, to losses and sometimes they just wear out as well. All right, so think um, repairability. And the blower's number one job is to bring warm, moist air to the evaporator coil for uh, conditioning. These systems must have filtered air, all right? But it might not be why you're thinking. All right, so I'll clarify that for you in a little bit. And in this picture, which I didn't mention earlier, I talked about an upflow furnace. 
well, here's an air handler that's laying on its side. That would, that would be a horizontal unit, normally in crawl spaces and attics. Um, most units, when they come off the manufacturing floor, are designed to be installed either direction, so don't get too caught up in that. Notice that filter is before the unit. All right, the return ductwork is coming in, goes through the filter, then through the air handler. All right, it's critical that we do that. A lot of people don't want to go in the attic because it's dirty, it's dark, there's spiders, there's not a ladder, whatever it is. So they put the filter at the return duct, okay? They put their, the filter at the return duct. You don't need them in both places, all right? One or the other, all right? So I said we needed filtered air. So the question is, is why do we need filtered air? A lot of people think we put filters in there because I have duct work and I don't want all that dust, dirt, debris, mold spores coming out of my ducts and landing on my head and getting my dining room table dirty and things like that. Well. Another one, that's not why we have a filter, <laughs> has nothing to do with humans, all right? We don't put filters in HVAC systems traditionally for humans. Now, I would say in, in some cases they do in certain, um, you know, uh, hospitals air where they have to wear, worry about IAQ, indoor air quality, but also a lot of people now, and this is anecdotally, um, since COVID, people are like, man, I want to filter the air in my home more. So they go out and they buy HEPA filters and they try to put them in their HVAC system. Be careful. These systems are not designed to operate with HEPA filters. Those are very tight. You, the, the blower and the, the compressor, you might burn them up because they, they can't pull enough air through those. They're not designed for that. These are just designed to get the bigger particles, um, and this is why. We need to protect that evaporator coil. All right, the evaporator coil, sometimes called the A coil because of the design, looks like this. Uh, it has pipes going through it carrying liquid refrigerant and uh, sandwiched between those same fins. All right, and we need to keep it clean. On the outside, if our coils get dirty, you can spray it off with a hose. Um, not a pressure washer because you'll damage them. Inside, you can't get to this and you got to keep it clean because we have to have good, um, clean surfaces for the air to touch it. So let's talk about what's going on in here and that'll make a little bit more sense. We have the refrigerant coming in through the liquid line through the metering device, some kind, sometimes called the expansion valve, um, out the bottom through those capillary tubes, looks like a little octopus there. And it is a cold liquid refrigerant, all right? Remember outside it was a hot gas refrigerant. Inside it's a cold liquid refrigerant, completely different and it's going through the A coil, all right? We're gonna, the blower's gonna be bringing warm, moist air to it. And when you force that warm, moist air through the coil, guess what happens? The second law of thermodynamics for the second time, the heat leaves the air and goes into the refrigerant. And by the time the refrigerant leaves the A coil, it's a warm vapor being uh, taken out through the suction line. So now you got the complete circuit um, going there. So now you, now you know all about that. So you got to keep the coils clean because if the air doesn't touch the coils, like if they're dirty, you know, it's like having a blanket on it. The air doesn't touch the coils. You don't get good heat transfer. It just kind of ricochets off and um, you're going to burn up your system. So I can't tell you how many reports we send out where things are end up being not covered because people simply didn't maintain their system. They didn't clean the coil outside and they didn't change their filters. Um, they didn't get good heat transfer and they burned up their um, compressor. So anecdotally at home, make sure you're doing those things. All right, so let's move on. We're in a warm, moist environment and we have a cold metal device, which is the evaporator coil. We're gonna have condensation. We drain it into this drip pan and we drain it off. Some people don't understand that the drip pan is not very big. It's not a whole pan because you got to send air through that evaporator coil. It's just around the outside. It's a U-shape. It's not very big. It's trying to collect all that water. If also, if you don't put in a filter and you get a lot of dirt and debris on the A-coil, it drips into the drip pan. And you, then you get a water loss because your drip pan's all clogged up and it overflows. And if it's in the attic, uh, you know where the water ends up, your dining room table. You normally drain that off to a drain or to the um, um, outside if you're in a place to do that. But if you're not in a place to do that, you use a condensate pump as seen here. So not all systems have this, 
But if they do, um, you know what it's doing. The condensate's going in there. You're pumping it to a drain or somewhere outside. Those fail all the time as well. So then they can be part of the loss um, too. So again, not all systems have those, um, but many do. So just checking my time, make sure I have enough time. And I think I'm right on schedule to uh, get through what we need to get through. I know I went fast on that. I know we have a limited amount of time. So again, hopefully you're putting your questions in the questions bar and I can stay after and clarify anything um, that you want me to. But I do wanna show you this video that ties it all together. So everything I told you now, watch how it works in motion. We have our home here, this cutaway. We go to the thermostat and we turn it down to 72 degrees. Sounds like a nice temperature. The system starts running. It starts pumping that gas refrigerant to the compressor. And this compressor is called a scroll compressor. And you'll see as we open it up, these two scrolls are going against each other. And this gas refrigerant, as it's going through the scrolls, is getting hotter and hotter and hotter, and the pressure is going up. By the time it comes out of the top port of that scroll compressor, it's a hot gas refrigerant going out to the um, condenser coils. So back and forth through all those coils. While that's happening, the fan engages and pulls ambient air through and across those coils. And lo and behold, the second law of thermodynamics takes over and the heat leaves the refrigerant and goes into the passing air as dictated by, or shown here by the blue lines in and the warmer red lines coming out. The refrigerant changes back to a liquid, goes through that filter dryer, gets pumped inside by the compressor, goes through that expansion device or expansion valve metering device, different people call it different things. And now it's going into the evaporator coil as a cold liquid refrigerant. So now we have a metal device that's cold and the blower's bringing warm, moist, humid air to it. The first thing that's gonna happen is condensation. In our diagram, we're gonna send it down to this condensate pump and pump it up and away. If you have a drain nearby, you send it into a drain. If you're in an attic, maybe you send it out to the gutter or outside the structure. As we open the system up, we see the blower down here on the bottom of this furnace, and it's pulling warm, moist air from the structure, bringing it to the evaporator coil to be conditioned. And as you can see, warm, moist air in, cool, dry air out through the supply ductwork, making our homes and our cells feel um, drier and cooler and more comfortable. As we zoom into the side here, you can see this is a furnace. Those uh, heat exchangers, uh, they're not in play. Okay, the air just passes right through them. In the winter time, when you're running the furnace, the evaporator coil is not in play. The air just passes through it, okay? So as we zoom out, we see this entire process happening and um, in concert, the inside and the outside working together, we're transferring heat from the inside to the outside, making us feel more comfortable. So like magic, but it's all science. That's how your air conditioning systems are working. So that video is available on our website if you ever need it. Maybe you want to revisit it later. Maybe you have some other adjusters you work with that you think would benefit from that. We also have one very similar that shows how furnaces work, which can be very helpful. And they're both narrated. So, all right. I'm going to move on and try to get through a real, real quick review of R22 and the main talking points that are probably a challenge for a lot of adjusters when they're getting pushback from contractors. So R22, sometimes known as Freon, although that's a brand name from DuPont, is an HCFC. And it wouldn't be a good insurance training without acronyms, right? And this is a doozy, hydrochlorofluorocarbon. And yes, I've had some practice saying that, right? Hydrochlorofluorocarbon, four chemical compounds turned into one term. So we have hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine, and carbon. The one we're concerned with here is the chlorine, which is an ODS or ozone depleting substance. All right, the ozone's real. The ozone does have a hole in it. Um, the ozone's um, responsible for filtering, or at, filtering out UV radiation. All right, if we didn't have the ozone, we would all burn up, literally. That would be a bad thing. So the way it is now, it lets through some UV radiation and we get sunburned or we get skin cancer, or we get cataracts, or our marine environments like um, coral reefs get damaged, all right? So the hole in the ozone is repairable, and believe it or not, it is getting better. One reason it's getting better is because we have um, things in place to help regulate um, things like chlorine gas that damage our ozone. One of them is the Montreal Protocol, which phased out HCFCs January 1 of 2020. 
that was a big date. That was a big deal. Um, we've been talking about this for over a dozen years, right? Back when I was adjusting 15 years ago, we were talking about this. Um, guess what? 2020 kind of got overshadowed by something else. <laughs> I wonder what that was, right? But anyway, um, this date came and went and we phased out R22, all right? Which means it made it illegal. And I'll tell you more about that here in a minute. But here's my question to you. What changed on the way we handle repair claims to R22 systems? Um, what's different from December of 2019 to now or January of 2020? You know what the answer to that is? Nothing. Again, maybe I caught some of you by surprise by saying that. Um, nothing changed. All right. We can repair R22 systems without issue. Let me tell you, you need to know the phase out facts. This is these three points are going to be your holy grail to talking to contractors um, and changing the whole conversation on an HVAC claim where they say you must upgrade to R410A because R22 is illegal. All right. Here's how this conversation goes. When they say R22 is illegal, it was phased out. You say, yes, I understand that because phase out does mean we cannot create or import virgin R22. So that's where they stop talking and they think they have you, right? So here's where the conversation continues that you're not hearing anywhere else. Per the Montreal Protocol for the last dozen years, it's been required that all R22 coming out of systems must be reclaimed. Okay, it goes to a reclamation center, they boil it down and bring it back to new. All right, reclaimed R22 is indistinguishable from brand new R22. You can't tell, I can't tell, the technician can't tell, and the system can't tell. All right, it's like new. And we've been reclaiming lots of R22. There's a lot of systems just coming out of, there's like, there was like 40 million R22 systems still in existence. And they just uh, come to their end of their lifespan. We take the R22 and we reclaim it. So we have a, a, we have a stockpile of R22. Eight and a half million pounds a year, as a matter of fact. When we were making it in the United States, we were making about 4 million pounds a year. So we've been um, reclaiming it higher than making it even back when we were making it. Per the Montreal Protocol, and this is your this is the kicker right here, per the Montreal Protocol, it's legal to use, buy, and sell reclaimed R22. All right? We can get it. So when they say they can't get it, they're, they're, they either don't want to get it, they're not looking hard enough, or they want to sell a new system. It's available and you can get it, okay? If you're getting any pushback and need some help, we can certainly step in and break that tie because that's, uh, that's what we do. And it's, uh, it's, it's really should not be an issue at all. They're hoping you don't know that. They're hoping you don't know that. Their next push is gonna be, we can't get the parts. That nine-year-old R22 system compressor that got zapped by uh, lightning, I can't get that. You know what they might be saying, and I'm going to definitely give the contractors the benefit of the doubt on this one is, hey, I called my distributor on the other side of town that I deal with, and he doesn't have it on the shelf. That's probably true, all right? Because they're, they're not as readily available, but that doesn't mean they're not available. So parts are available in the United States, all right? So you just need to know how to find them. They're not going to take the time to track it down. We at HVAC investigators have access to all the distributors' data, all the manufacturers' data, which is equates to over 60,000 data points. And if that nine-year-old compressor is on a shelf somewhere in the United States, we know where it is. We know how much it costs. We have the part number, and it'll show up on our report. So Lauren gave you a little preview of our reports. If something shows up on one of our reports, it's validated that it's available down to the part number and the price. Okay. Unlike picking something out of your estimating software and just say, oh, look, here's a compressor or, or look, here's refrigerant. Just because it's a line item doesn't mean it's available, right? If it's on our report, it's been validated, it's available, um, and you can get it. So that's uh, some help that might, um, might uh, be useful at some point, knowing that. So those are your talking points right there on R22 that I guarantee you will change that conversation 180 degrees when that contractor says, we have to replace the system because R22 is illegal and I have to upgrade to R410A. All right, hopefully that helps you out there. So 
that was a lot of information. Felt like I was uh, speeding through that, which I was to make sure we got it all in, but I feel, felt it was all very useful um, knowledge for you guys to have as adjusters out there. So just real quickly, we're gonna save five minutes for questions. So I just need another 30 seconds to let you know um, we're passionate about adjuster education. And we do, besides these uh, individual sessions like we're doing today, um, we do open webinars for the entire industry. And we have a couple coming up. Um, Donan University, our, our partner, is doing one coming up on May 11th on chloride failures. That's uh, chlorides in the water that causes uh, water losses. And HVAC investigators, um, we're doing one of the essentials of settling water-related HVAC claims. And I'm going to be leading that one, and that's on June 8th at 2 o'clock. And we are going to talk about all different kinds of water losses, including flood. I know a lot of you are flood adjusters out there, but I also know the flood conferences that week, and many of you might actually be at the flood conference, but if you can find time on Wednesday, June 8th at 2 o'clock and get some good information, and both of those have free CE credit. And I know all adjusters to stay licensed need CE credit. So um, we're gonna help you out with free CE credit on that as well. I'm right on time. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, but I was watching the clock closely. So it's 1.55. We're now gonna turn it back over to uh, Julie and see if she's harvested some questions from the chat box that uh, we can attempt to answer today. And again, I can stay on as long as we need to, even if we go past two o'clock. So what do we have, Julie? Um, okay. So I'm not sure, and Hector, I may need you to elaborate on your question. He wanted to know if the units are available and if the coils are available. But Hector, if, if you'll elaborate on that a little bit. Yep, and while he's elaborating, and maybe I can just start on that, is every claim's gonna have its own unique um, circumstances and brands and age and things like that. But more often than not, we can do a repair, meaning we can get coils. That includes condenser coils. And I think adjusters overlook that all the time. If a condenser coil gets crushed by hail, don't buy a new condenser, get a new coil in that condenser. That is a repair an HVAC tech can do um, affordably and not have to repair or replace the whole system. Because if you replace the whole system, you might then have to upgrade from R22 to R410A. If you do a repair like a new coil, you can stay at R22. That's a key point. Absolutely. I think David had a question. David, do you want to unmute? Hey, can you hear me? I can. Yes, sir. Hey, um, Jay, I, I thank you uh, for all this information. I, it's, it's an eye opener. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really when you, when you think, I know I'm guilty of it. I'll touch on a few things. Um, just the repairability piece that you spoke on, um, just because it's not working doesn't need, it's, it's not an automatic replacement. Like you said, I love the analogy of the, the automobile yeah. and the parts on it when they're damaged, you can, you know, nine times or eight times out of 10, I can't remember the graphic, but they're, they're replaceable. I was, I was guilty of it in the past. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the adjusting world is, you know, it's damaged and, is more of an intimidation because it didn't know so much. Oh, let's just, all right, we'll just allow it to replace it instead of trying to go through to see if it's repairable. So um, that was uh, very, very informative. Uh, the video that you had uh, for me, I'm hopefully for the others that tied it all together, uh, the way you explained it. I hope so. Uh, what you were talking about and then watching that video did that. The question, uh, another comment though, when you said cleaning the coals, um, that brought back a time years ago, whenever I had a tech come out and service my unit from time to time, um, he had the garden hose out there and was spraying the, um, the unit outside the, the coals. And, and now, you know, when you said that, I was like, oh, well, that's, that makes sense. That's what they were doing. Yeah, you know, we've had people uh, ruin, we've had people ruin them, um, with pressure washers. They're like, Hey, yeah, a hose, a hose is good. A pressure washer must be better. Right. <laughs> and they just destroy their co coil with a pressure washer. So right. don't do I a pressure do washer. <laughs> um, the, you know, another thing was the cycle time. I uh, know it helps. Uh, that's, uh, that's here in the end. The recent years has come mm -hmm. a, um, a hot topic or, or yep. a subject for uh, claims is reducing that cycle time. So I, I can see where it helps the dollar savings uh, that you guys presented there was um just an eye opener as well and the the services you know you've got the the hvac 
uh, investigator in the strike net. You know, not everybody knows that um, you guys handle uh, power surge and lightning uh, claims and on electronics and all kind of other systems. You know, uh, yep. it's 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 a lot of uh, a lot of work out there and. and uh, things that come up the response time i tell you what i was correct me if i'm wrong and lauren may um chime in but i think you said the response time for submitted request it was like four hours was the turnaround time is that right i take yes, that one yeah, so typically speaking, whenever we receive a new assignment, uh, we will automatically send a text message to the insured, assuming that they can receive a text at that number. Uh, so that gives them an opportunity to immediately respond, sometimes even within minutes. Uh, but if we do not receive a response from the insured, we will contact them within two business hours uh, to yeah. make initial contact, confirm any of the needed information that we need for our assessment, make sure the address is notated correctly, do we need a ladder, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing as far yeah. as the and the, the, the four uh, hours you might have been picking up on was when she was talking about our eye check or desktop mm. review. So if you know yeah. the cause of loss, right? It got crushed by a tree. Yeah, I mean, you know what happened, but you just need to know what is that unit, what's it cost? Um, we can turn as long as we can get a hold of the contractor, we can turn that around in four four hours on a standard HVAC claim. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Resident. Great. Yep. Um you know, another, just another comment, saving the line set that uh, you know, when you're making a repair you don't automatically it's not an automatic to replace the line set those can be saved uh, absolutely everything adds and, up and that was that was uh that was good as well the r22 the three facts you know um that's again i think that's that comes along um more with you know they're the experts and and not uh, discrediting, discrediting anybody, but you know, it just needs to be replaced because R22 is not available anymore or, or whatever. But I have heard, and I've actually allowed for the repairs in the past where they, I think they call them drop-ins or drop droplets or whatever it is for the They R22 have a drop-in refrigerants and yeah. we at HVACI don't allow drop. I mean, if the homeowner decides to do it, they can do that, but there are risks associated with that. So we don't, yeah. We don't work with, or we don't recommend drop-in or uh, ref, you know uh, supplement refrigerants besides R22 or R410A. So right, right. The uh, uh, but the point is, is that it's still available for the yeah. older systems. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. So that's uh, definitely seen some questions in there. Are units available? Coils available? Yes. Again, always try. I mean, it's not yeah. going to not be 100% of the time, but it's going to be much more often than you think. I see another question out here about um, R410A and R22 working at op different, different pressures. And that is true. You can't take an R22 system and put R410A in it because they work at different pressures. The R410A will um, basically leak out, blow it up uh, after time. So you definitely can't do that. So it's either one right. or the other. So, Right. And um, somebody else wanted to know where would contractors get reclaimed R22? Uh, yeah, they, they should know where to get it. If they don't, we can certainly help them out. But there's these reclamation centers and there's major brands all across the country. And if a technician told you they didn't know about that, they're either a brand new uh, technician that uh, that maybe really doesn't or they're in an area of the country that they're not right next to one of them. But that would uh, the other likelihood is, is they're trying to move that um, to a replacement probably. So And um, one of... Uh... I have someone who would like to ask a question, Mr. Terry Pritchard, who has actually um, been a speaker on our Claims Corner before. So Terry, can you, I think you're unmuted. Good morning, Jay, can you hear me? I can, how you doing, Terry? Man, I enjoyed your presentation and- uh, Glad. Thank you very much. Um, I deal directly with flood, so flood is our game and it's a common issue with systems and the flood program has certain uh, regulations regarding uh, pairs and sets and what we can and can't do. Um, one of the things that I have run across when dealing with the ductless mini splits is often the contractor, the HVAC contractor will come and say that, you know, we have an outside unit, the little suitcase compressor, the inverter driven compressor, Yep. Um, we can't get a matching. When you have a mini split ductless, if it either part of that goes bad, we have to change the whole thing. And that's a common theme that I'm hearing. Is there any truth in that or is there no truth in that? Well, um, 
there is more truth in that than a standard split system. So mini splits are okay. a little bit more challenging. There's been several players that have come and gone in that market space. Um, if it's a newer unit and one of the three biggies, you know, Mitsubishi's the, the biggest one probably out there, Samsung, maybe Fujitsu. I would try it. And we certainly have been successful in, in several of those, but it is more common that you're going to be replacing inside and outside with a mini split than a um, standard split system. So again, not, not don't, have any, don't have exact numbers on there, but it is going to be a little bit more common. You could still probably so, save the line set and the inside parts, not nearly as expensive on a head unit that it is if you're doing a whole furnace or um, air handler. So that shouldn't be a huge, that shouldn't as big a, be as big of impact if you do have to do it. Okay, so uh, second observation, I was recently doing some uh, RCQC, random claim quality checks in New Jersey, and I went to a home, home had a basement, they had, an, they had a traditional split system with an outside condensing unit, 100% duty cycle on off, the regular one that we all know and love, and inside the basement, they had a vertical um, air handler furnace combination, it was gas fired, mm -hmm. and that's what they had in. Um, and I observed that on the photographs. When I went to do the RCQC, I was walking around the perimeter of the home and I noticed the outside unit, which looked very much like a ductless mini split compressor unit. So that caught me off guard. And I go inside and I look at the inter interior unit and it looked very much like what was there pre-flood. Mm -hmm. So I took the data down and looked up the information online and what they had installed for this policy holder was an inverter-driven ducted system, which is the first time I've come across one of those. It works very much like the ductless, meaning it's not 100% duty cycle. You can throttle the inside and the outside units together so that they maintain high efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But this was set up for a ducted system, a retrofit. And have you seen many of those? Uh, it, they're, they're up and coming. I would say, no, yeah. I, I wouldn't say we see many. A lot of them are newer, so they're not showing up on as many claims nowadays, unless it's something dramatic like a, a flood or a tree hit or something like that. But yes, that does exist. And we just kind of tend in the industry to say ductless mini split. Really? Right. Those are two different things. You could have a mini split that also has ducts, or you could have a ductless system, like a window unit's ductless, a PT, um, a PTAC unit is ductless and things like that. So we gotta be careful sometimes saying, mini splits are always ductless. That's that's not necessarily true. So um, even if you watch, I mean, I, I love to watch this old house. There's a couple great episodes where they put in a um, duck or a mini split condenser outside, but then they have air handlers in, in two different places on the inside. So um, it, that that certainly is possible. So don't be New don't be surprised. That is possible. That's not like in qual. That's not like kind of quality. What was there? Um, no. But if they chose to use their money that way and maybe upgrade, that was certainly up to them, right? Yeah, just a just a new observation. Every time you see yeah. something for the first time, you you yeah. want to investigate. Absolutely. And, see. and the, of course, the question, the wonder, of the future is the separate reliability of the ducted system like that going to be comparable to the non repairability of the ductless mini splits? You know, how's that going to play out in the future? So, yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Absolutely, Terry. Thank you so much. Great, uh, great insights there. And hopefully everybody who's still on with us uh, took something away from that too. Because again, there's there's a lot of uh, options out there. We can only talk about so many things, but there's, there's a lot of different things out there you may come across. Sometimes you need some help. Yes. Um, there's another one. How do we determine the tongue or tonnage? I'm sorry. Good Lord. The tonnage, that's always a great question. Um, there's a formula to that and I can't give you the exact way because all the different um, model numbers are different, but you can, you can Google it and come up with some um, basics of it. But it's basically there's somewhere in the model number, there's gonna be a number that's gonna be divisible. You know, If you, you take it out, it's divisible um, by 12. So like a 36,000, there will be somewhere in there, it'll be 36. 
So you know that's 36,000. You divide that by 12,000. So you know that's a three ton unit. So the problem is all the manufacturers have rearranged their numbers. They're not all in the same place. Um, but normally somewhere in the model number, you can see a number that's, you know, however you say it, divisible by four, divisible by whatever. Um, and if you, it's a 36,000, it's 12,000. If it's 24,000, it's a, it's a two ton and things like that. So there's, there's different ways to arrive at that. Again, be, be careful. Why they just don't put what the tonnage is on there is beyond me. I, I don't know. They also don't put the sear on it. The sear is even harder to find and sear might be even more important than tonnage nowadays. Um, there's federal regulations with the, the Department of Energy about sear. And that's, you can't even get that. You have to find the serial number, then Google it and try to figure out what the SEER is back in from, from that way. So there's some good sites out there that have uh, decoders of all the different brands on their model and serial numbers. So, Jay, we had a question from Ben. Uh, he wanted to know what is the cost for our service? So at HVACI, we do hourly billing, typically not to exceed five hours unless there are some unforeseen circumstances or maybe the uh, loss location is kind of remote in nature, but we bill at 125 an hour. Um, and it's, again, under five hour, or five or less hours is typically the standard billing for two or fewer HVAC systems. If we get into three or more systems, it does take a little more time on site so we'll sometimes increase the billing there. And then from a commercial perspective, we base it um, on hourly billing for the total number of systems and time needed on site at a rate of $150 per hour. And then for strike check, we actually base the billing on different item types. So if you have a specific claim scenario where there are certain types of equipment, such as the electrical, maybe that does or does not include other electronics or appliances, we can always get you a budget uh, prior to us going on site if that's something that you need. Okay, and I think there was one. Yes, and there was also one here from Daniel. Uh, do you all work with home inspectors? So when you say, do we work with home inspectors, essentially, you know, we work exclusively with insurance carriers um, and independent adjusting firms. So typically these are gonna be property claims where the insured has submitted a claim to you all. And then you ask us to go out and take a look at the HVAC or maybe some of those additional item types that strike check can look at. Um, in terms of who we meet with on site, once the assignment has been submitted to HVACI, if the home inspector inspector is like the on-site point of contact that you'd like us to meet with, uh, we can most certainly do that. We can meet with the policyholder, with the adjuster, with a contractor, a neighbor, friend, whomever that may be. Um, but we do direct our technicians not to discuss their findings on site. And we do that because we have our technical experts review all of the findings and data that is collected um, before we make our final determination. Yeah. It's all right, guys. Um, we, there's one last one and then we need to go. If okay. Sure. And this one is from Earl. Do you offer service calls rather than me having to track down a local HVAC contractor? Um, so when you say service calls, I assume that maybe you mean, uh, would we do the repairs? And we are primarily a damage assessment provider. Um, that is our primary role. However, once we have published a report, if the insured is having difficulty finding a contractor to complete the work, or maybe their contractor is unwilling uh, to do the work for the price that we've outlined in our report, as long as it is a resident residential loss, as long as it is a covered loss and non-wear and tear related, the adjuster can request what we internally call a referral. And our referral is where we would get someone in our network to complete those repairs for the scope of work and pricing that is outlined in our report. There are just a few stipulations there. Again, it must be covered and non-wear and tear related. And we do this exclusively for residential claims. Um, but if that ever, you know, is of need to you, feel free to give us a call. We can issue that referral. We have just a couple of basic questions that we'd like to ask, which is why we ask that the adjuster be the one to request rather than the policyholder. All right, guys. One more, Thank one more, one more. <laughs> Hang on, one more. <laughs> First, the, the the most important thing, if we need you, how do we, how do we get your service? How do we, how do we? Yeah. Great question. There are, there are many ways to submit a claim. Um, number one, we have a website, which is HVACinvestigators.com or strikecheck.com. You can submit a claim there as a guest, or you can create an account, which would give you access to our adjuster portal. And our adjuster portal is great because it allows you to submit new claims. You can check the status of your current open assignments. Uh, and you can also upload any kind of documentation, photographs, uh, estimates from the contractor, whatever that may be. 
So those are two ways to submit online. You can also submit an email to assignments at hvaci.com and internally we'll collect all of the information that we need and get that claim set up that way. You can also give us a call. You can call our main line, which is 888-407-5224. Again, that number will be on the website as well. You can call that number or call your relationship manager directly and uh, they will be able to get that set up for you. Awesome. Is that it, right. David? Yeah, that's it. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> no, wanted, you're fine. I I'm wanted everybody to, to know all this and great information. Guys, we need to know how to get in touch with you guys. Yeah, so. we want to help. Yeah, yeah this was and, awesome. Thank you guys so. so much. Yeah. Thank you um, so much. Yes, Absolutely. it was a pleasure to meet you guys, and I look forward to hopefully doing something like this in the future with you guys. Yep. So this and was. If anyone has any more questions for them, feel free to email me here, and I will get in touch with them. And you all have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Thanks guys. for joining us. Right. Thank you, everyone. Good luck out there.